First story. OP found out her dead husband cheated on her after her husband's entitled friend's wife demanded OP's survival benefits after she broke up with her husband. OP wants to expose them, but doesn't want to ruin her kids and in-law's image of him. I originally posted this on a different subreddit, but I guess it was removed. I don't really know why, so I guess I'm trying my luck here. First, I'd like to mention English is not my first language, so if I make any mistakes, please don't come after me. I also made a new account because, one, I don't want my family to know I'm writing this and two, because I am quite honestly embarrassed about the diagnosis that led me to find out he betrayed me. I already know it will be a long post, so buckle up. Also, the names are fake for anonymity. I would also like to mention I know I need therapy. However, I simply can't afford it right now, so I guess this is the second best. I don't know. I 34F met my husband, James, he would be 33M if he was still here 17 years ago while I was in an exchange student program. I had just turned 17 back then and was in my last year of what Americans consider high school. James was 16 and in a grade below me. We met at school, and while I can't say it was instantly love from my side, James often said it was for him. I was the quiet, shy nerdy girl, and he was by choice the class clown, always full of jokes and humor. By the time I was done with my exchange student program, I had fallen hard for him as well. I went back home. We stayed in contact, but only as friends, convinced that if fate brought us together again, it was meant to be. As a part of my business education, I was to intern with a business, and as luck would have it, I was picked as the intern, there were five in total to go with one of the more experienced higher-ups to travel to America for a year, while opening an office there. It so happened to be the same city James lived in, so of course we were both excited, and we started dating not long after I moved over. When the one-year deadline was up, I was 21 back then, I didn't want to go back home again, and my work for the company had been stellar, so they were okay with renewing my work visa, so I ended up staying. I don't have any family in my home country, so I had no problems leaving. James and I married within that same year at a small intimate wedding with just his family and his best friend Dustin, same age as me. Married, they had a wedding, but didn't register their marriage to Crystal, and they have two girls they are important later. I finished my degree the following year and continued to work for the company I had interned for until I became pregnant. We were excited to add to our family, and things were good for us. His family mom, dad, older brother, and younger sister were equally excited, and they had taken me in like I was one of their own. My pregnancy was not easy, and we soon found out we were having twins, let's call them Jack and Jill. Not long after finding out we were expecting twins did my health take a turn for the worse. The pregnancy was hard, and I was put on bedrest early into the pregnancy when my ob saw concerning signs of preterm labor. James was my pillar of support, and when he was working, one of his family members would stay with me in case something happened. Due to the complications of my pregnancy, I was let go from my job. It was a tough blow, but we could deal with it. James was making enough to support us both, and his parents helped out a bit when we couldn't make ends meet. James started working more to earn more money. When Jack and Jill entered the world, it was awful to say it plainly. Jack came out first, and while he was small and a preemie, he was okay otherwise. I started hemorrhaging shortly after he was delivered, and James was escorted out of the OR. I had a C-section along with Jake, who was quickly taken to the N-I-C-U. I passed out just as I saw my husband leave the OR, looking like he was about to pass out as well. I flatlined, and Jill was taken out unresponsive and blue from what I was later told. They worked on us both for a while, but we both came back. I had some small complications from my dance with death, such as that I am always cold regardless of how hot it is, I get easily sick, my health has taken a toll over the years and I can't have any more biological kids, which was a big blow for my husband and me as we'd wanted a big family. Jill was physically okay, but she has been diagnosed with several mental health-related problems, none of which is confirmed to be due to her dramatic entrance to the world. Her mental health is something I will come back to later. But we didn't know this right off the bat, and while smaller than her brother, Jill seemed as healthy as Jack. So after a longer stay at the hospital, all three of us were eventually sent home. Dustin the husband's best friend from diapers had promised James he'd be there to see his kids be born, just like James had been there for both of Dustin's girls' births. Dustin blamed Crystal, his wife, for her not allowing him to come to the hospital, and we had believed him because we knew she was jealous and controlling, they both cheated on each other and were super toxic for each other. James was heartbroken about Dustin, 
not being there for him on the day that had both been the worst and best day of his life. Fast forward a few years James, and I are still going strong. Not only was he my husband, he was my best friend. My person. Because of how my previous job had ended, I had some issues with my Visagreen card, and was unable to return to the workforce once I had recovered. And while James made decent at his job as a manager, he wasn't making as much as he wanted. So one night he came to me and talked about a career change. Something he'd thought about for a long time. He wanted to get a CDL and start being a truck driver. I was a little hesitant because I didn't want him gone for weeks on end. But I was still supportive as it was something he wanted because we needed more money for the twins and the immigration lawyer we had hired to help us fix my visac. I worried he would be sent all over the US. But once he was hired, he got hired as a dedicated truck driver which for him meant he would only drive in the six surrounding states, and he'd leave Monday mornings and come home again Friday nights, sometimes Saturday mornings depending on his loads. During these years I had noticed a pattern with Dustin, and I had come to the conclusion that he wasn't as good of a friend to James as he thought. Dustin only really came around when he needed something, and always promised my husband he'd be there for various important events, but never showed. For example, he has never shown himself to any of the twins' birthday parties or would come over and hang out when my husband invited him over and so on. But James would always drop everything when Dustin needed his help. We argued about that a few times, but ultimately I gave up trying to make him see that Dustin was just using him. He wasn't going to see it until he was ready to see it. And if I'm honest, I think my husband was just in utter denial over it because of how much they had been through together. With James gone all week, I was alone with the twins, and I had started noticing things were off with Jill. She was quick to anger and would often either cry or get physical if things didn't go her way. Much more than a normal toddler. I talked with my husband, who never saw anything wrong, which I couldn't blame him on because even at three, I had noticed how differently Jill acted towards me compared to James. Because James was only home 48 hours a week. He was the fun dad and never punished them. So I was always the bad guy. When James was home, Jill was a sweet little angel and always a daddy's girl. I talked with him about it. But seeing as he never saw what I was telling him about, he thought I was blowing things out of proportions. One day, while James was on the road, I took the twins to see their grandma Mill, and Jill had one of her meltdowns in the car, which shocked Mill as she had come out of her office to greet us and help me inside with the twins. She witnessed how Jill hit me repeatedly and pulled my hair and was yelling and screaming at me and at Jack. Mill told James what she had seen, so he finally started believing me and shared my concerns for our daughter. Her doctor diagnosed her with ADHD and recommended a child therapist, I took her to once a week. She was four at the time and wasn't really talking with the therapist. However, the therapist did observe Jill and her outbursts. She couldn't control her impulses. She'd act on them before thinking it through. She was diagnosed with intermittent explosive disorder, and her therapist suspected bipolar as well. However, due to her young age, she wouldn't label her as such, but would keep an eye on it. Things were rough. James was still working as a truck driver, and when the twins started school, the teacher observed Jill and raised concerns with her. She couldn't pay attention, and when she was told to do something she didn't want, she became destructive, followed by her hiding away, because she knew what she'd done was wrong, but she couldn't stop it, her own words. She would pull her own hair when she got overwhelmed and hide under her desk and refuse to come out. She also didn't play with her peers. She would play along with them, but not actively interact with them. If they asked her a question, she would answer. But she never initiated anything with anyone Jack included. Eventually Jill was diagnosed with another mood disorder, and it was confirmed she was high-functioning autistic. With that, we finally got the right medication and tools to help her, and life settled down for us. Somewhere between this and the next part of the story, my husband had also seen through his friend and had realized he was pretty much just being used. So he went minimal contact with them and was really only there when it had something to do with the girls, as my husband was their godfather. 2019 was the year the immigration lawyer was finally able to get my visa, GC sorted out so I could finally start working again. And with the twins mostly settled, I didn't wait to look for jobs. I got one in my field of education, and things were looking good for our little family. 2019 was also the year it blew up in Dustin's family. He'd finally had enough of his controlling wife, and he left to go to his dad's. He was done with her, but continued to pay the bills because his two girls lived in the house with Crystal. Dustin started dating new girls, and Crystal went ape SHT on him, 
So Dustin asked James to be the go-between. I never liked Crystal much because of how controlling she was and her behavior really. So when my husband first asked me to help her out with something while he was on the road, I was initially hesitant but ended up doing it mainly for the two girls that were living with her. Crystal was helpless, honestly. She didn't have a license, no job, and no real friends. She always stayed home and didn't know how to do a lot of things. At some point in my helping Crystal, we realized we had a lot of things in common hobby-wise, and we started talking. And I realized it wasn't really Crystal that had been the evil person all these years. She had just been used as the scapegoat. James had also been told this by Crystal, and he had started helping her out more on the weekends when he was home. Something I didn't have a problem with as he had never given me a reason to doubt him. And I honestly thought everything was good between us. 2020. Syl had her son Alex. All was well and good. Syl surprised me by asking me to be in the delivery room with her and Mel because her best friend was down in the ER because her husband had tried to kill himself. The birth went well, and he came out kicking and screaming, and everyone was in tears and happy. Then 2021 came, and COVID hit hard in our area. I was let go when everything was shut down. Mill, who already had a failing kidney, got it and passed away early in 2021. The family was devastated. We went through the motions, and then three months later Phil announced he has a new girlfriend he is moving in with. Took everyone by surprise, as we'd be a close family beforehand. We were all together several times during the week, and always had Sunday lunch dinner followed by card games. James, my Sill, and Bill were not prepared for this new woman. And things got very tense, very fast. Phil pretty much forced all of us to meet this new woman before anyone was ready for it. Syl's birthday midsummer was a SHT hole because of it. Phil had taken this new woman and forced James and my Bill to meet her on that day. Syl had been forced to meet her earlier. And while this new woman was nice enough, none of the siblings had been ready to meet her. So despite them being happy, Phil was happy they were not over with this woman. My husband took it hardest and refused to spend any time with her, practically begging Phil to allow them time to grieve the loss of their mother. He refused to listen, saying if they couldn't accept her, then he wouldn't spend time with them. My husband refused to spend them with them, so we stopped going over to their mill and Phil house. Phil stopped any family gatherings with us and started spending time with her side of the family. Syl and Bill, who'd become silent victims of Hubby and Phil's Cold War, came to our house for Sunday dinners. We took COVID precautions. Not long after the twins' eighth birthday, SHT hit the fan again. My husband and I both tested positive for COVID. I was home with the twins, who thankfully never got it, while James was on the road. He came home early and was sick as a dog. I'd kept the twins away from him as much as possible, and seeing as they had tested negative several times, I'd sent them to a family friend for her to watch them, so they wouldn't get it as well. My husband got worse and had a hard time breathing, so I took him to the ER. I dropped him off at the door and went to park. As I came back to be with my husband, I was turned away at the door, saying if I wasn't sick, I wasn't allowed in. Devastated and worried, but still understanding due to the pandemic, I went back to the car and called my husband to let him know. He promised to keep me updated, so I drove home to call to come and get him. I had been to the ER just days before and got the plasma treatment. So we were expecting Hubby to get the same. However, several hours later, Hubby called me and told me he was getting admitted because his oxygen was too low. He stayed in the ER for several hours after calling me, waiting for a bed to open up. Shortly before I went to bed remember, I was still dealing with the aftermath of my own COVID and was extremely tired. He finally got a room. He kept me updated the following day, and his O2 continued to drop. 24 hours after he was admitted, he was put on a ventilator. I was devastated and worried. I was allowed to go visit him in the ICU and talk with his doctors about his condition. I wasn't allowed near him and had to stay out of his room. He was on a ventilator for a week, and I called twice a day as I'd been asked not to call more again. I was understanding of this, and I could visit him once a week. And I did. It so happened that our 10th wedding anniversary hit on the day I was allowed to visit him again. So of course I did. I spent less than an hour there per their recommendation for my own safety and went back home. The update I got from the doctor three days later was a good one. His O2 was going up, and they were considering taking him off the ventilator. I went to bed with a smile on my face and my two babies beside me that night. Shortly after midnight, I got a call from the hospital my husband's condition had taken a drastic nosedive, and I should come to the hospital ASAP. Frantically, I got the twins out of bed and into the car. 
and while Sil said that I needed her to watch the kids, because the hospital had called, I rushed to the hospital. A few hours later, Sil called and said she'd gotten Bill to come to her house and watch all three kids, and she was coming. I'd kept her and everyone else updated on Hubby's condition. I sat in the waiting room while they worked with my husband to stabilize him. Phil and his new wife Ye, they had gotten married at this point had self-quarantined because one of her grandkids had tested positive for COVID and they had been in contact. I called Phil and told him he needed to go get tested for COVID so he could come to the ICU. But the only place he could go to get tested didn't open till 8 in the morning, so he had to wait. But he would be the first in line when they opened. Sil and I were led into the hallway so we could see my husband after he was stabilized. And they had a priest there with us if we needed it. We made awkward small talk, and Sil and I tried not to cry too much. Around 4, Hubby had been stabilized, and we were told I could go home and get some sleep. So we both drove to Sil's house each in our own car. We sat up and walked with Bill a bit. Then I took the twins and started heading home. I was only halfway home when I got another phone call summoning me to the hospital. I made a very illegal U-turn and went straight back to Sills and rushed back to the hospital. Deep down, I knew this was it. I got there, and shortly after, Sill called and told me her regular nanny was taking all three kids, and she and Bill would drop them off there and come to the hospital. They came. About an hour later, Dustin came he'd seen Sill asking for prayers on Facebook. I got an alien suit and was allowed to go into my husband's room to say goodbye. He was in complete organ failure and there was no coming back from that. His body was so stiff and so cold, and I knew he was gone, and only the machines were keeping his body alive. I asked them to keep him on so his father could have time to come say his goodbyes, which he did, and five minutes later my husband's time of death was announced. Everything after that was a blur to me. I felt like I was underwater, and no one was talking clearly. It wasn't until I saw my kids again that I felt like I came up for air. I had to be strong for my kids. They had just lost their favorite person in the whole world. We all sat down as a family and told them. Jack didn't believe me and kept saying daddy was just driving his big truck, and Jill shut down. She got quiet. Didn't cry, didn't ask questions, didn't scream nothing. She just sat there silently, like a statue. Jack had started sobbing and yelling at us all for lying to him, begging for us to tell him we were lying to them. Jill stayed quiet, and then suddenly she just went back to her drawing, still not saying anything still not reacting. It was like we had never told her her dad had died. Jack was sobbing in my lap as I placed my hand over Jill's and asked her if she understood what i just told her. She said yes, daddy has gone to be with grandma. And then she went back to drawing. I didn't know what to do, so I just let her continue to draw while I sat there next to her trying to comfort Jack while my own tears were running down my cheeks. Jill's reaction came several months later, and it wasn't good. She became violent and destructive once more. Her behavioral issues became more prominent and harder to deal with. She would lash out at me and at Jack. She started self-harming, and at one point I had to get her committed to a children's psychological hospital because she tried to kill herself. All my own problems and grief were put on the back burner because I had to make sure my kids would be okay. Jack had been the one to alert me that something was wrong with Jill after her attempt at self-harm. Both my kids were in weekly therapy. And Jill told her therapist she wanted to go be with her dad, but she didn't want to leave me and Jack. But her lack of impulse control made her act on her first thought. To be with Daddy, Sil, Bill, and I grew closer and leaned on each other, and they have been a huge help and support for the kids and me. Phil felt guilty over how things had ended between him and James, yet things have not changed between Phil, the kids, and myself, so things are still tense there. And my kids still miss seeing their papa, their second favorite person in the whole world, as often as they did before everything fell apart. And they feel abandoned by him. And they feel like he doesn't love them anymore because now he has new grandkids that are better than them. Their words. I'm not really a people person. And I prefer being alone over being with company. James and his family were my only family. And I didn't really have any friends either. Yet somehow I had found myself as a new friend of Crystal. Of course I talked with Syl and Bill about my kids, and how life without James was, and I confided in Crystal, whom I had helped more and more over the past year before James died. Her and Dustin had been in a custody battle over their kids, and I had driven her to and from court every time. She ended up losing them because she wouldn't get a lawyer while Dustin had one. About a year after James died, I still didn't have a job. Between the struggles with my kids' grief, Jill's behavioral issues, and my own depression, 
I found it impossible to go out and get a job. The survivor's benefit I got from my husband allowed me to stay home and be there for my kids while they went through this. Not having a job made it easier to get them to, and from their therapist appointments and everything else we had going on. They didn't need more changes than they already had, so I tried to keep everything the same. Jill got some intensive therapy and started doing better. Same with Jack. We'd found a new normal, and we were living day by day. It was hard. I missed my husband. I had constant pain in my chest from the loss of him, and I felt like a failure of a mother watching my kids, especially Jill, struggle as much as they did. I still hadn't really had time to grieve and really process his loss, because the kids and their reactions and mental and physical health had taken a forefront, and I had done what I always did best. Push my own problems and issues to the back, and be there for the few people I held near and dear to me. Then one day, I was at Crystal's house government housing, because she still had no income but her own choice. And she wanted me to lend her $5,000 from the life insurance my husband had. Something she knew about because James had told her he had drawn it knowing truck driving could be somewhat dangerous. I wasn't comfortable with that. So I said no and explained those funds were earmarked for something. She got mad and started saying some hurtful words. It broke me. She told me how James had confided in her, that he wanted to leave me, and that he had been cheating on me. How she had talked him into staying with me, because it was what was right for the kids. I didn't believe her and told her as much before leaving her house. James had never given me any reason to doubt him, even with him on the road. There had never been any signs, and while we had our ups and downs, we always talked it out, never went to bed, or left the house angry at each other, because you never knew when it would be the last time you could talk with them. I never talked to Crystal again and blocked her number when she kept trying to call me. I kept telling myself she was lying, just trying to hurt me which she did, but her words kept ringing in my ears. So I looked through his phone, his gaming computer, his laptop, and his tablet and found nothing. It was a relief, and yet it continued to bug me. So I went to my doctor and got tested for STDs, thinking it wouldn't result in anything either. James was my first, and, to this day, still my only. And according to James, I was his first and only. The first I know for sure because he was just as inexperienced and awkward as I was the first time we were together. I was also tested for STDs during my pregnancy as I believe it is common in the U.S. They came back clean as well. I was simply doing the STD tests for my peace and mind, and once they came back clear, I'd push it out of my head. Only when the results did come back, my broken heart shattered. Four different clinics later, and the result was still the same. I had tested positive for herpes. Something I have still yet to really accept is a part of my new reality. It was another blow, and suddenly I felt all the love I had for James vanish, replaced by anger. Anger that he cheated on me. Anger that Crystal was right. Anger that he wasn't alive so I could confront him. Just so much anger and devastation. So many questions I'd never get answers to. How could he do this to me? To us? Where had I gone wrong? Why hadn't I known? Or seen the signs? It's been a little over a year since I found out. And I still don't know how to deal with it. I still have a portrait of James on the wall. And every night before bedtime the kids give their father a kiss and tell him good night. And all I want to do with that picture is throw it out into the fire pit outside and burn it, because I am still so angry at him. I am still so broken over his actions. And then the guilt comes in because I can't do that to my kids. I can't destroy the pictures of him like he destroyed me. I hate that my kids miss him, and the guilt I feel for feeling like that numbing yet so damn painful at the same time. I've come to the conclusion that it was probably a lot of lizard he'd cheated on me with. Or maybe more. I don't know, and I never will. There were no signs of any affairs. No suspicions about texts, apps, phone numbers, or anything. I haven't told anyone about it. Like I mentioned earlier, I don't really have any friends, and his family is the only family I have. My own family f ed me up pretty badly to begin with, and the few friends I've had over the years have either drifted away or hurt me in one way or another. I can't tell his family about it. I don't want to ruin the image they have of their brother or son. I can't be the person to talk bad about the dead. I just can't. But not telling is starting to take its toll on me. I've lost my will to live. I'm not self-harming. I don't want to die. I want to be here for my kids, and I will make damn sure they will grow up to be two good people. I love my kids and want to give them the world. For them. I want to watch them grow up and become two people that matter. That makes a difference and an impact. I want to watch them find someone they love and have their own families. I want to watch my grandkids if I am blessed with them run around my yard and bake cookies with me in my kitchen. 
I love cooking and baking, or I used to at least. But I find it hard. I get up in the morning and fake it until my kids are off to school. The moment they are on that bus, my depression kicks my arse. I don't want to do anything. I have no motivation for anything. While my house isn't a hoarder's nightmare, it isn't as clean and tidy as it once was. Deep down, I want to go get a job and get out of my house. I want to get back to loving life and being in my kitchen. I want to join a gym and start working out, because, in my depression, I've gained weight, and the thyroid problem I have had makes it damn near impossible to lose it again. I want to start doing my hobbies again. There are a lot of things I want to do. Truly, there are. But I don't. Why? Because I can't find the motivation to do any of it. I want to do it, but I don't. How do I move past this? How do I get over my husband's betrayal when I can't get any answers or closure? How do I live the rest of my life, knowing what I thought was an amazing marriage was a lie while pretending to my family his family that he was a good and loyal man and husband when I know he wasn't? If you've made it this far, thanks for reading. Second story. Sister accused our stepdad affair partner of saying her. And my cheating mom took his side after he denied everything. So I got him kicked out and arrested. Now he is getting bailed out. And I'm scared he will end us or end himself. Hi, I'm new to Reddit. So this may not be written like a usual post. It's a long story. I just need a place to get it off my chest. And hopefully get some advice because I just feel so lost. I 19M have a younger sister 15F. Our parents got divorced when we were young. I am still old enough to remember it and struggled a lot with the experience. It was a nasty divorce, and we went through a lot. My mom and dad got divorced because my mom cheated with my now stepdad. We'll call him Gary. Gary joined our lives pretty much straight after the divorce and has lived with us since. My sister has always had a strained relationship with my dad, and I think she always saw Gary as more of a dad than our actual dad ever was. It's been over 10 years since then, and we have maintained regular contact with our dad. But Gary has always been consistent, making our lunches for school dimmer when we get home, and giving lifts to wherever we need them. We had a great upbringing and enjoyed time at home. Gary was never perfect. Over the years he has become more grumpy, angry, and irritated. Nothing of concern until an incident last summer where he turned physically aggressive with me. That was when I realized that I was 18, and he could treat me how he wanted. Did he ever give a SHT? Who knows? From that point I was wary of him. Me and my girlfriend of two years started to keep our distance from the family. I slowly began to feel separated. My sister, Gary, and my mom formed a very tightly knit family that I didn't seem to be a part of anymore. I wasn't home much due to the nature of my work and spending more and more time at my girlfriend's with her family. One night a couple of months ago, my girlfriend was talking with my sister. They are fairly close and talk regularly. My sister told her that she needed to get something off her chest and proceeded to say that she had seen Gary jerking around the house. She had brushed it off at first, but was now starting to think he was doing it for her to see, not even hiding it from her. My girlfriend was shocked and immediately told me. I went to speak with my sister, holding back the rage within me. My sister said it had been happening for a couple of months, and that Gary had confronted her about it, and told her that he knows she has seen him, asking her how she felt about it. I was furious. I wanted to go and give Gary the beating he had coming there and then but I knew that it would just cause more trouble. I decided in that second I just needed to get me, my girlfriend, and my sister out of the house. We left quickly to my grandparents, leaving my mom wondering what on earth was going on. Later that evening, my mom came over to my grandparents to see us, and we told her everything. She said she needed to go back and confront Gary. We offered support, but she said she had to go alone. She stayed the night at home and returned in the morning. She said that Gary denies everything. Perhaps he had been careless once or twice with jerking, but never for my sister to see. My mom spoke with my sister privately, and between them they agreed we could all go back home and forget this ever happened. It was a huge misunderstanding. I hated that. I knew something wasn't right, and I refused to return home for a couple days. However, in time things went back to normal again. I was always wary of Gary, but I started to forget it and trust again. This brings us to two weeks ago, when we were away on a holiday. It was the last night, and me, my sister, and my girlfriend are in the hot tub, having deep talks as you do. My sister mentions she's been feeling really down, and I ask why. She doesn't know. I knew there was something she wasn't staying, so I started to pry a bit more. Eventually I asked, did everything Gary stop after last time? She shook her head, and my stomach dropped. I asked, has it got worse? She nodded her head. I feel sick. I start to ask more questions. 
Long story short, Gary has been spam messaging her, commenting on her looks, how much he loves her and misses her, and how good she looks in her bikinis. He's been encouraging her to drink alcohol so they can have some fun and mess around. He even had the balls to go to her room one night and ask her to pull her top down for him, amongst other horrific things. Obviously I've just found this out, and we're stuck in the middle of the countryside with this sick man, my mom, and my grandparents. I knew we couldn't run away as easily this time. So amid my breakdowns in the bathroom alone, I protected my girlfriend and my sister. I hid them away in my room as casually as I could. I called my grandparents away and admitted everything to them too. They suggested we leave in the early morning unnoticed and go to their house. My grandparents would deal with everything from there. And that's exactly what we did. My grandparents managed to speak to my mom alone the next day and tell her everything. Luckily, he left without much of a fight. He simply denied everything and all knowledge of any messages despite our proof. He left to his mom's, leaving us alone in a broken house. My mom is now single for the first time in around 20 years, dealing with the fact she has been sleeping with a pedophile for 10 of them. My sister is so traumatized she can't talk about any of it. She just breaks down. I'm trying to pull it together, look after the home, and balance my work and other commitments. And my girlfriend has just been an absolute soldier. She's moved in with us temporarily and is supporting us all in every way she can. Me and my girlfriend have both dealt with our own saw in the past too. So this has brought back a lot of history for us to work through. It's SHT, but there's definitely a sense of a weight lifted off all our shoulders. Looking back, he was manipulating each of us in our own ways. He was pushing me out of the family, grooming my sister, and isolating my mom from all of her friends and family. He has messaged my mom consistently since, saying he's starving himself and overdosing on pills claiming he will die any day now. My mom is ignoring it, and putting a brave face on, I think. It must be tearing her apart, but she doesn't talk about it. A couple of days ago, we decided we needed to tell our dad. He was extremely comforting to my sister, and is being a great support for her. However, to us, he has insisted we either go to the police, or he will go and deal with Gary himself. He's livid, and it's torn him apart. Two days ago, my mom reported him to the police herself. Yesterday. The police took statements from my sister and mom. They still need mine. Today they have arrested Gary. The worst part is, I haven't even begun to process any of this. Suddenly, he feels like a home comfort, and I miss him. I actually feel sympathy for the man. It's so messed up, and I'm so ashamed. I'm angry, and I want him to be punished for what he has done. But I also just want things back to normal. I want nobody to have been hurt. It feels as though the world is falling apart and I'm holding on so tight to keep it together. I know I have people to turn to, but everyone else is dealing with this too. How can I turn to them and expect comfort when they must have it ten times worse? Gary will be bailed out any hour now, and I know he'll be angry. Maybe he'll come back to the house. Maybe he'll try to hurt me or my mom. Maybe he will actually just end himself. I have no idea. I'm aware no one can help, but it's good to get it out. I appreciate it if you have taken the time to read and hope all made sense. Thanks. Thank you for watching the video. If you are interested in listening to these kinds of stories, we've got more in store for you. Simply subscribe to our channel, hit the like button, and share it with your friends.